Hugh, it's just so such an honor to have you on the podcast. You know, I, I know how much you love fishing. You know, we're going to talk about your music, um, your hearing loss in 2018, and how fishing may have really became more and more prolific, may have possibly saved your life. Um, so there's a, really a lot to, sp- to speak about. And I just like to, you know, just say also, too, I, I love your passion for conservation. You know, I see you at the BTT events and you're always there. You emceed the event in New York last year. You're you're you got a big spectrum and a monster heart. Thank you. Hey, I, 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 um, it's a it's a pleasure for me. You know, I, as you mentioned, I lost my hearing. And so, I, you know, I used to be on the road 120 days a year. So uh, now I have it 120 days that I got to find something else to do. So I've plunged into conservation, something I've always cared about, but not ever had enough time, you know. So I've said yes to a lot of stuff, maybe maybe a little too much stuff. But uh, uh, but it's it's it fills me up. It's a great feeling. And, you know, the more you fish and the more you hunt, the more you respect the resource. So that's uh, it's time to give back. Yeah, you know, and we'll we'll talk about that evolution between you know your heyday uh, in the '80s, you know, your big music and big albums, uh, and the transition to you know your hearing loss. Uh, let's go back a little bit. You know, Huey Lewis in the news. Your name is Huey Anthony Craig. Um, how did you? Where did the Lewis come from? Uh, I was in I, I was in a band called Clover, and we got signed. Uh, to a record contract by Phonogram Records in London, a- in England. And we moved to London and lived in London. And uh, we did some session work. I put a harmonica player, so I played uh, session work. And uh, I did it, but we didn't have a green card. So we had to be on the QT. And uh, we made a Twiggy album, interestingly enough. Made a record with Twiggy. And they wanted to credit us on the back of the record. And so I... Oh, it was this is the punk thing. It just kind of started, and everybody had made up their names. And my nickname forever was Lewis because my first girlfriend's father used to call me Huey Louie, and then Louie, and then Lewis. Oh, awesome! So I just picked, I just took that name, and, and then the band Huey Lewis and the News. Then the band Huey Lewis. We were actually called Huey Lewis and American Express till, and we were signed to uh, uh, Chrysalis Records as Huey Lewis and American Express. We made our record, and on the eve of the release of our first record, they were worried that American Express would sue us. Oh, right. Nobody had ever done any corporate tie-ins at all, of course, which is hard to believe nowadays when you think of everything's corporate, you know. But uh, And so we had 24 hours to come up with a new name, came up with the news. That's all we could come up with. (laughs) (laughs) It, it, It hit home, that's for sure. Do you remember the first time you heard your voice and thought, Wow, this is kind of a. Is yeah, I like I like what I'm hearing. It, it kind of scared me for a while. And my, where was that? When was that? Uh, probably in, a, in a, a 75, 76, 77 with Clover. We went in the studio, and I I only sang one song with with Clover, but we 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 cut it, and I and it was I remember it was interesting. I, I learned a, a, a ton about my about technique and I knew nothing about that you know I did, I was just basically shouting and um, <laughs> I learned a lot you know but you but you were playing the harmonica before right yeah I was, you were just jamming on that thing yeah I played harmonica uh, since I was you know since a early high school and I sang but I but I never sang with a band I always just played harp with the band so uh, and th- but I sang on the QT and and I always kind of aspired to sing you know so when Clover broke up, that's the first thing I did, just start my own band and have a go. Right. Um, what was your life like growing up? What, what, what did your parents do and where were you? I think we were talking last night about the Russian River and your dad was a right. fisherman too. Yeah, my dad, well, my dad used to make me fly fish, you know? <laughs> he would, he would, and I, I, I wanted to, because when we went fly fishing, we had to drive, we always drove up to the Sierras, you know, from San Francisco. I was raised in Marin County, and we'd drive up to the Sierras, and, and it was a long drive, you know, and I, I wanted to play ball, and but uh, but but I learned to cast young, and so I we fished, you know, uh, as, a, as a kid, but my parents are very eccentric. My dad was a, he was a radiologist, but really was a jazz drummer by passion, and he played piano and jazz, and my mom was born in Poland and was an artist, and escaped the war, and uh, she was born in, 
She she left in 1939 when the Nazis invaded Poland, wound her way down to Brazil where she lived for five years and uh, and studied art and, and practiced art and and separated from her parents and then reunited with them in in uh, in America when they got out and then tragically my grandparents committed suicide together because they were uh. they had, they were very wealthy in Poland and they'd had kind of this. They were discriminated against, and and life wasn't that good for them. And that, mm. and my mother, that who had uh, the whole path through Europe, America had been the the, the freedom. You know, America mm. just stayed wherever there was jazz, there was GIs, and there was freedom. And she was cool, so she fell in love with America and jazz. Came to New York, married my dad, who was playing jazz, and although he was going to medical school at the time, he was playing jazz. And then when her parents committed suicide, she turned away and became a drop. That's when she dropped out, kind of, as it were. And she became like, my mother was really one of the very first hippies. Wow. Hmm. Very, so you came from a very artistic family. Very, way more eccentric than me. I'm sort of the, the hippie backlash. <laughs> <laughs> Um, tell me, where did your dad learn how to fly fish? Uh, well, Bill your, Shad was a patient of my dad's. Oh, okay. My dad was a radiologist, and he was a bass fisherman. Top water, though, with the you know the casting reels, the mm-hmm. Fluger Supremes, and the, I mean the um, the bait casting reels where you had to right. thumb them for the drag because sure. they're they backlash. Backlash, yeah, yeah, and um, and top water, uh, you know hula poppers and jitterbugs and that kind of stuff. He was a top water snob. But then when he when we moved to California, he discovered fly fishing. Bill Shad was one of his patients and he started throwing, you know, fly lines and and shooting heads for for steelhead. Did fly fishing connect with you at the time? Uh, you know, it did not not really. I yeah. mean, it was funny. Uh, it did, but I didn't have the passion for it for some reason. I, I don't know why I didn't. I, I was interested in music, I guess, was, right. was 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 what I was primarily doing. But I definitely went fishing with my old man, and and uh, and 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 I enjoyed it. I, I just it wasn't nuts for it like I am now. <laughs> right? Was there a moment where all of a sudden? Um maybe aside from your hearing loss that all of a sudden you you felt like man I, I really want to do more of this yeah uh, 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 when I first joined a band uh, in uh, I was at what I was at Cornell we had a college band and we lived in a house together and and, uh, and and one of the guys there fished and he said hey I'm going to go fish fly fishing I said well yeah you know I can fly fish too so we went and in the Catskills and found a little stream and fish and caught these tiny little trout like that. But I'll never forget how wonderful it felt to be in that stream uh, uh, with Mother Nature, you know, just me and and the outdoors. He went off, we were waiting and all that stuff. And and, uh, uh, that's the first time I really felt that. And and of course, that's, that's... The beginning. Yeah. Do you remember the first time? You you were connected to fly fishing? Oh shoot! I mean, I think it was the first time you took me to the Keys and we started tarpon fishing. So you went right to the because I was with the salt. Uh, my stepdad the first time I fished, I believe, fly fished on the river. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was. Yeah, it was I the key. I've got some in my pocket here for you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't introduce me to the sport. No, I'm joking. No, it was the first time you took me down to the Keys and I flopped a cast out there and started stripping, yeah. and a seventy pounder came and ate it, and it was I was hooked. It was yeah, just the yeah. bite. Was you, you went right to the the big leagues um but it's really interesting in that when you were in that element and i remember the first time i actually had tied my very first fly i was just learning about casting and i right away uh chuck fothergill taught me how to tie flies a couple other buddies of mine we went, went to the river it was a renegade and the renegade was floating sure. and this fish came up and grabbed it. it was like oh my god i mean that was it it was you it, know? it yeah. was it but uh, we you all, know what I think it is? I mean, you can, uh, <laughs> what the thrill for me is finally, it's really about Mother Nature and connecting with Mother Nature. And you say, well, you know, you could just walk, you could do a nice hike and you still get that. But when you, when you, when you fish and you have to outsmart this fish, right? You got to get deeper into Mother Nature that way. You connect in a deeper way, I think. And that's, the, that's the thing that you love. You know, you finally catch the fish and you release the fish and then you go, 
whoa, you look around and it's just this amazing feeling that you're a part of something much larger than, than you are. You know? Well, let's go back a little bit. You talk about the most uh, an amazing feeling. What was it like walking out on stage to a full stadium that was just going crazy? What was it, sorry, one what, more time. What was it like for you as uh, being in the band? Right. You know, having a you know, the, the top selling album. Right. You know, and you were on fire. What was it like to walk out on stage with an audience audience filled with people? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 addicting. What can I tell you? It's it's a wonderful feeling, um, but it, it it's helpful. Uh, you know, funny. Uh, I'm mindful of. They asked Johnny Car- uh, uh, Groucho Marx was was on the Johnny Carson show, and they asked Groucho, "Who's the best comedian of all time?" And he said, "Jack Benny." He said, "Why?" And he said, "Well, it's going to sound funny, but it, he had utter contempt for his audience." <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I think the message there is, in other words, you're about to go on stage, and there's however many people out there, 10,000 or whatever there are out there, and they're shouting your name, you know, before you go on, Huey, Huey kind of thing, right? What you can think two things. You can think, wow, I'm really fabulous. Or you can think, man, are they knuckleheads? (laughs) (laughs) And I think it's healthier to think of them as knuckleheads. So did you actually think of that when you were on stage? Kind of, a little bit. I mean, did that it's, ease the nerves? Not, huh? Did that ease the nerves? It, did it ease? Did it ease the nerves a little bit when you thought like that? Yeah, a little yeah. bit, a little bit. Was there nerves no, when you no, go well, on yeah, stage? There used to be nerves, but uh, uh, when you get, you know, when you get enough under your belt and experience, you need that. Those you you need you need that that those nerves. Uh, trouble you, complacency sets in. We do the same show over and over and over and over again. Well, you know, our same roughly the same show over and over again and different towns and what well, well, you gotta fight against complacency. So it's nice when you come to New York City and oh my gosh, there's the audience is all session musicians and guys you respect and actors and blah blah blah. Well you get you're a little nervous and that's good. Right. Nervous Did, is good. Was but does your voice crack? I mean, is it hard to control your voice when you are nervous in the early years? Eh, not really. I mean, is there like in golf, we get nervous and we yip a putt or whatever. Yeah. Is there any sort of uh, that sort of a nerve effect in as well, a singer? Well, there's some similarities in that if you're singing and you need to sing a high note, you don't want to think of it as a high note and strain for it. You want to think of it. You want to go straight through that note. In other words, swing easy and let the club do the work. Sure. And the same thing is true when you sing. 80% goes further than 100%. And, uh, you know, it's just... or than You know what? I can relate to that to like fly casting in the wind. Same thing. Yeah. Most people, they think, okay, I got I to gotta throw this out at 70, 80 feet. It's blowing 20. And they just put too much conscious thought into it, you know, and they just react so fast. They don't finish the back cast and they just jump on it and big tailing loop and it's over. Um, uh, yeah, and you don't want and just like a cat. You don't want to give it gas at the beginning, and the right. same thing is true with a note. You want to sneak up on that note, right? Um, tell me about eighty three and eighty four when you guys really hit it big. What was that like? Well, it was a little crazy, you know. Uh, uh, the was they didn't ha- they didn't have cell phones yet, so we it was autographs. So instead of just a bunch of people taking your picture. If you were in an airport or a you know a shopping center or a or a McDonald's or anywhere like that, you just get autographed. And right. So, um, but and so there was a lot of that, and it was, it was sort of uncomfortable, really. I mean, I I love being appreciated. You know, sure. don't get me wrong, but but you know, it's better. Uh, a lower, slightly lower profile is actually a little better. Did, did it ever get to a point where you just did not want to go outside in public? Yeah, I mean, you know, here here's the thing. Anybody who does what what I did and what we that has got to like the attention a little better. He wouldn't have done it in the first place. Right. So the fact is, you do. But part of the time, you love that attention, and then another part of the time, you tolerate the attention, no problem. And hopefully, there's only a tiny, small part of the time when you go crazy, because it can happen at any time, right? Mm-hmm. You, I mean, you'd be wrecking. You could be. You could just get some tragic news about your of a family member, and then somebody wants an autograph. So sure. there are uncomfortable right, stuff. Right. You know? What was it like living uh, on the road? 
living out of a bus and hotel rooms and uh, the, the pressure of doing, what, 125, 35 shows in so many days and well, nights? Well, it, it, it's, it's interesting, right? It's both good and bad. I mean, you think about Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan. I mean, these are two guys who are on the road almost all the time. Because there's a lot of advantages to being on the road. Number one, you don't have to grow up. You live like a 16-year-old kid. Somebody does your laundry. There's food everywhere. You got your own bunk and a, and, and a star bus. You got a shower and a big double bed in the back. And, you know, it's like a, it's like being on vacation. Uh, but, again, you get very little input, you know. It's the same thing. as a, It's a routine over and over again. So, if you want to... Find out what the real world's doing. You got to get out of that cocoon a little bit, right? Because um, I think it was in '84. Um, you were up against like Purple Rain and Thriller and Springsteen when your album came out, and yep. and you guys were number one. I mean, yeah. I mean that's that says a, so much. Those guys are monsters, as are you. You know. I mean, yeah. I mean, the thing I'm proudest of is we we actually produced the record ourselves because we knew. If you think back, this is not, this is early '80s. This is '81, '82. There was no jam band. There was no internet. There was no avenue to success other than to convince a record label to take a chance on you, and then out compete the other bands on that label so that you were a priority. So you couldn't test the waters in any way. But there's a, no. You just had to. You had to. You had to. Make yourself attractive to a record label and get a hit single. CHR radio, which is contemporary hit radio, mm -hmm. was the format. I'll go back just a little ways. Top 40 radio was invented with the advent of push button radio. So the, 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 the programmer opined that as long as a, a listener didn't hear a song that they didn't like, they'd stay on that station. But now they had a push buttons. If they heard something they didn't like, they could push a button and switch station. So narrow your playlist. Just play the hits over and over. Top 40. Well, by late 70s, early 80s, it was top 23. It was called CHR. See, FM radio started. That was uh, top 40 was AM radio. FM radio was started as an alternative to AM radio in the 60s. They played anything and everything. They had a stereo format and so on. But by seven, uh, cars used to only have AM radio. Now by seven, late 70s, 80s, cars, had, everybody had FM radio. So the FM radio started catering to everyone and started narrowing their playlists and doing the same thing. And by late 70s, early 80s, the only format that matters was CHR, Contemporary Hit Radio, which is hit records. And that's what you had to, to exist. You know? So you, you wrote for, for radio. So we wrote for it. We produced our, and I, I knew there were going to have to be commercial considerations sure. that I didn't want to, I didn't want to, do, uh, you know, uh, one eyed, one horn flying purple people eater. Right. I didn't want to have to do that. So we wanted to produce a record ourselves so that we could make those decisions. And, um, you know, and we aimed, frankly, we aimed almost every track right at radio. And that's why the, the sports album is so disparate, because one was kind of a bluesy tune. One was kind of a rock song. One was kind of because I knew we needed a hit. I didn't I didn't think I didn't know we were going to have five of them, <laughs> right. but I knew we needed one. But I remember back in the day, excuse me, Nick, but everything was on uh, MTV. How, yeah, how important was MTV? Was MTV is hugely important. And think about it. MTV played, if you remember, there was a whole... Uh, MTV's playlist was mirrored radio and records, which is the tip sheet or the Gavin report, the radio playlist exactly. So if you had a hit record on the, on the radio, then that video would get heavy rotation on MTV, no matter how bad the video was. And that's why there's some of those horrible videos that they just kept playing over and over and over again. There was no Because the record was it. Yeah. Hmm. You know? so, Interesting. Well, I was, just a, gonna, I was just gonna say, was there ever a battle between writing a song for you and, and writing it for the radio? Was there ever like a, you know yeah. what I'm trying to say, like a conflict on? Um, uh, you know, you know n not writing the song, but capturing it on, on, on record, yes. In other words, songs pretty much write themselves. I think and it's 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 a most purest form of 
musical art is the writing. You know, it comes to you when you grab a guitar or whatnot, and you, and then you, 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 you. But I think I don't know where that comes from. I think the muse, let's say the muse, comes. But now you have that idea, and you have to capture it on tape or on record. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Mm. And you know, you can allow those choices to be really commercial or not so commercial and you know how long something goes how the, the lyric in the verse and all that stuff all can be a variable how you how you, i mean how it's how it's captured how 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 you produce it interesting mm-hmm. you know huh. were you inspired by any bands were yeah you, lot, uh, lots i mean i mean is, are you inspired by a certain kind of music also yeah i mean i, I grew up as a as a rhythm and blues snob you know i love black music a harmonica player and start off with little walter and son by williamson and then then you know uh, uh, johnny taylor and l wilson pickett and sam and dave and otis redding that that was where, what i really liked but when i went to college i joined the or my fraternity band if you will and we had to learn all kinds of stuff so i i, I found that some kinds of music i preferred listening to but all music was fun to play. And so uh, I, I, I ceased to become a snob at that point. Right. And like that, and I really feel like Duke Ellington said, two kinds of music, good and bad, you know? You mm-hmm. made mention last night at dinner, you were talking about um, Chuck Berry. Yeah. And how he evolved the blues into uh, rock and roll for the white audience. Yeah, I mean, so, tell me that, he, about he that. consciously created, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, Little Richards did part of it. A lot of people had things that, you know, uh, 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 had, things, Influence. had, had influences in rock and roll, but nobody more so than Chuck Berry, who single-handedly, he, you know, his mother was a domestic in a, in, a, in a white home, and after school, he would go to that house and do his homework while she finished up work. And he would hear on the radio all these uh, R&B songs covered by Pat Boone and all these other things, and and the and the white kids and the white people were really digging this, and so he said, "Boom!" So he wrote his song. He was the first singer songwriter ever. He's the first guy to ever write songs for kids. Ring, ring goes the bell. To, 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 right. to, and and his his grooves instead of being swing, you know, was was a very kind of country white feel, you know? Right. So he consciously wrote those songs for the white kids for for profit. I mean, for, you know, mm-hmm. for... Uh, for and, and in his lyrics, too, you were saying about New Orleans, you know, yeah, and him because, saying New Orleans, right? Right. They had an old, the old folks, uh, what is it? The, they had a teenage wedding. The old folks wished them well. Yeah. Went down to New Orleans, uh, you know, uh, and everybody said New Orleans, you know, white people called it New Orleans. Interesting. So, it's fascinating. Tell me about the time you met, uh, I think you were talking about uh, James Brown backstage or something last night. Yeah. Well, James Brown, you know, James Brown was a good baseball player. He was a pretty and, good and, ba- and you had a big passion in baseball too. Yeah, I love baseball. Uh, it's my favorite sport. But yeah, I, I met him at a at an R and B awards thing, and he I, I I introduced myself to him. I'm a huge James Brown fan, and I just jumped. He had an army of entourage around him, and I thought, well, they're not gonna. I'm just one guy. I'm not gonna get hurt. So I just <laughs> plunged into the mass and thrust my hand out and announced myself. Said you don't know me, and he's man. I know who you are, and he proceeded to launch into this long dissertation about back in the '80s when he was funky, I was also funky, and we were funky together. Oh, I that's that. awesome! I wish I had a tape of it. And then he went on and on and on some stuff that I couldn't quite understand. But and, and he made mention also something about Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, right. that that's that's a what famous uh, thing on that Jace Brown said. When he was on David Letterman, David Letterman asked him, what do you think of Bruce Springsteen? And James said, it's not kind of funny, but he's a heavy. Which is, sounds kind of funny, but he's a heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But he, but James Brown, is, was a, besides being you know, one of the most important uh, artists of uh, 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 an American popular music, really, was a really sweet guy. Uh, when After 911... They had the big Philly uh, concert, 
uh, we 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 were on the bill with these. There must have been ten bands on the bill, and uh, at Vet Stadium there was fifty five thousand people. James Brown was on a couple bands after us, and he showed up early to watch our set. Did he? Yeah, and it was really sweet. And when I came off of the wings, there he was standing there, and he said, "Man," and he complimented me, and I said, "Wow, that's great." Well, believe me, I'll be here watch, watching your set. You know, if you want me to sit in, James, I'm ready. He <laughs> says. Oh man, we got it. We got a thing. We're doing our thing. I said, "Well, I, I'll see." He plays harmonica in his set, or you d- did when he was, alive, and 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 his his man would come out and bring the harmonica to him on stage on a little plate, a you know, on a platter kind of thing. And and uh, so I told him, I said, and and I, I can't remember the guy's name. It was you know Jerome was the guy from uh, from the uh, oh gosh. I'm losing my mind, but I can't remember his his guy's name. But he's standing right there, and James is there. And I say to James, I said, James, I'll, I'll bring you your harmonica. <laughs> and, the, and the big guy says, oh, now you want my job. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> what kind of music do you listen to today? Well, I don't because of my you, hearing. Yeah. I don't at all. But, but until I lost my hearing, I listened to a jazz. Found myself more and more just listening to straight up jazz. Both big band jazz and 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 bop too, but I love the big band jazz era. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you three records that are just unparalleled that people should just. One is Ella Fitzgerald, the early years with Chick Webb. It's just unbelievably great music, and this is we're talking thirties and forties. I mean, Ella was eighteen when she first started singing with Chick Webb, and they were an all black band, mm-hmm. and uh, because America was segregated. And, you know, when you think about before 65, 67, the great the minds of the black generation were musicians. They couldn't be doctors and lawyers and go to law school. They were all musicians. And, uh, and uh, you listen to Chick, and Benny Goodman knew this. That's why he, with his all-white band, he, he staged the first battle of the bands at the, at the, at the uh, Bowery Ballroom in, uh, in New York. And... Uh, that was he in an effort to put uh, point people to how great Chick Webb was, and, and that's the first time that black and white band played on the same stage at the same time. But anyway, her record uh, it, it's Chick Webb, Ella Fitzgerald, and Chick Webb, unbelievable. Another one is Sinatra's "Live at the Sands" with Count Basie. Oh wow! Is arranged and conducted by Quincy Jones, and Quincy took all the Nelson Riddle arrangements and adapted them for the Basie Band, which is really cool because the pads, like all the strings, and Nelson Riddle had all these strings, and they all, and he has the reed section doing all those pads. And what, you know, when you have seven saxes playing, it just, it moves so much air. It's just, and the, the live, it's just phenomenal. And it's Sinatra at his best too. Sinatra Live at the Sands, 1965. And, uh, 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 another great record is Satch Plays Fats. Louis Armstrong plays the music of Fats Waller in 1955. I think it's his... If you're going to buy one Louis Armstrong record, it's... Wow. And it's spectacular. Dude, uh, what about Aretha Franklin? <laughs> the right? best. Nobody better. Nobody better. She could sing the phone book, as they say. Yeah. Nobody uh, better. Um, let's go back to uh, the movie. Um, you know, back to the future, the power, the power right. of love. Uh, tell me about that relationship and what did that movie do for for your music at the time? Well, a lot. I mean, um, in actual fact, uh, uh, they contacted us. Uh, they being Steve Spielberg, the producer, Bob Zemeckis, the director, and Bob Gale, the writer, and said, "Let's have a meeting." We had a meeting with my manager and I, and they said, "Look." We've just written this film, and there, our lead character, Marty McFly, his favorite band would be Huey Lewis and the News. So we thought, how about writing a song for the... And um, I told them I was flattered. I didn't know how to write for movies necessarily. Uh, but I, you know, and I, and I didn't really fancy writing a song called Back to the Future. And they said, oh, no, we don't care what it's called. We just want one of your songs. So great, I'll send you the next thing we write. And the next thing we wrote was Power Love, pretty much. Wow. And then... Um, and the film hadn't been done yet. I didn't even. I didn't even read a script. I just. And then I, by that point, there was a script and some sh- and some some footage that they sent me. And I went, "Oh, this isn't going to work because 
you know, there was no love object really uh, uh, in, in the film, but they used it great, you know. And so uh, um, that was it. Then they wanted me to write one. They wanted us to write one more song for um, for the credits, and that's how. We, by that point, Back in Time was written after I saw the film. Mm -hmm. What was the greatest album you wrote? That not well, only the most successful, but what was the greatest album that you wrote that was closest well, to your heart? Our biggest album in America is Sports. Yeah. But Power of Love, which was the next thing we recorded for this for the film, right, was not was not on one of our. We weren't allowed to put it on one of our records. It was bought Ex exclusive out by, by the film. MCA and the movie company, and they put it out on their soundtrack record, which didn't sell at all. It sold like because it had Power of Love. I think an Eric Clapton record and a bunch of uh, a bunch of source music, and so it, it didn't sell, and, um, and 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 we weren't allowed to put it on on our, one of our albums in America. But our next album was called Four, and we were allowed to include it in the rest of the world. Wow! So when we included uh, included it on Four, Four became our best selling record everywhere but America. So when you when I we go to France or. Germany or Japan or Australia, it's a whole different five songs are the are the most popular than the five on sports. It's not hard to rock and roll. Oh, I want a new drug, heart and soul, and uh, if this is it, it's perfect world, stuck with you, do it off my baby, and and those are much oh, bigger. Oh, interesting. Hits. It's interesting, right? Very Jacob's interesting. Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, yeah. And you want a Grammy for that? Huh? You won a Grammy for that Power of Love. Yeah, we did. We we got a Grammy. What we should have won. We should have won an Oscar for Power of Love because right. from the film. But they gave it to Lionel Richie, who had written "We Are the World" that year. That was the same year, and it was the Academy's chance to honor Lionel. I yeah, think. that's my story because he his song was "Say You Say Me." It's not even one of Lionel's great ones, you know. Right. God damn it, Lionel. <laughs> he, oh, no, he's, he's a good guy. <laughs> he's, Lionel, joking. he's a real good guy. Uh, it's kind of interesting because music is so subjective. Right, exactly. In sports, there's a finish line. It's starting to get in the finish line. But music is so abstract. Was, was there ever, ever a period of time where you're struggling? Like, what do we like versus what do they like? Which was one of the questions you asked earlier. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you're, you're dead right. I mean, it's one thing to... You know what we did on my my our career. We aimed what we wanted to write. What we 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 wrote the songs that came to us, but we produced them yeah. to be hit records for them. Mm -hmm. But after we get sports was so big and power of love, I vowed that we wouldn't do anything for commercial reasons ever like, again. Ever again. And we, and we never did. Well, our next album was Small World. We explored different rhythms and stuff. And then we did a couple records where we liter literally captured the, 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 the sound. Four Chords in Several Years, Soulsville, where we, we just recorded live and captured it and without any overdubs and stuff. It's got a really neat feel to it that way. And, you know, left a few mistakes in there. Right. Because it, it was real. Yeah. Uh, if you're making a record that's going to be played on AM or, you know, CHR radio over and over and over again, you, there can't be any mistakes there. You got to fix all those. Does the audience know mistakes that they, they, they don't made? know on the first listen, but it's subliminal. They will know. When you play that thing 27, What's nine, it, nine what? times a day, you, you, it, that, that that demands perfection. Right. But what, but, I, but it's maybe not healthy to listen to a song nine times yeah, a day. Yeah. You know? What would be an, imper an imperfection that you're, that you're talking about? Oh, a little out of tune note or a beat drop, just a little bit or... or, or Enunciation or, or, or something. Or a little bit, bit of a clam somewhere or some... Uh, more and more likely... You know, if something was out of tune, we'd fix it. But more likely, a, a rhythm thing where the mm -hmm. rhythm gets a little bit out, but it's kind of fun. Right, you know? it still works. Yeah. What's it like to be in a production room when you when you're mixing everything? Well, it, I mean, that's where the magic is, right? Yeah, well, kind of. Yeah, I mean, you know, mixing a record is editing a film. The director of a film is the producer. Producer of a record is akin to the director of a film. And mixing a record is editing the film, mm -hmm. so it's kind of boring to be honest. But right. but it's amazing all the effects you can put on each individual voice and instrument and track and track, you know, and uh, and and assemble those things carefully. And that's that's how you get a record. I mean, nowadays there's Pro Tools, so everything's Pro Tooled. So if it, 
it comes across a screen and it, with, with musical staff, and you can see the notes as somebody sings. And if one note, you can see that it's below where it should be. So you grab the cursor, you poop, you raise it up. Right. Now it's in tune. Wow. So no, there's no, no more out of tune. No more. Interesting. It's all machines now. Hmm. Before we came over here to Boca Grande, I was telling my mom, I said, we're going to go interview Huey Lewis. And we were listening to all your songs. And she goes, God, I had the biggest crush on Huey Lewis. So I, <laughs> I took my sister, we flipped to New York and watched him perform. And she had the biggest crush on you. No kidding. Yeah. Well, she obviously has excellent taste. <laughs> <laughs> How did, uh, did it ever get hard being a rock and roll over a period of time, having to create new music and be on the road? Was it difficult? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you spend your whole life assembling your first record. You know, mm-hmm. your second album, you got some bits and pieces that you had left over. But when you get to the third and fourth album, you really got to kind of make it up and you don't want to repeat yourself. So it's kind of hard. You know, Thinking. I mean, the creativity that, might get a little. It, it does. And that's what writer's block's all about. I mean, it, it gets harder. As you, as you, the more you've done, and mm-hmm. and you know, and the older you get, so. How did you get out of a writer's block when you had it? How do you, what do you do? How did you get out of it? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Time. I mean, I wish I knew. Because I, I asked, I asked uh, McGuane the same question. He said, <laughs> "Excuse me." <clears throat> I asked uh, Tom the same question. How do you get out of writer's block? And he said there was another uh, author that told Tom, he said, go to your room, go to your writing room, and don't leave. You stay there, and it'll come. It might take a while, but he said that's how he got out of it. That's interesting. I, 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 my, my experience is different. I, I, I find that if, if you, you know, in, in Nashville and a lot of places that we have writer clinics and stuff, where guys get together and they, they put co-writers together and say, go write a song. Looks looks good on paper, you know, you and this guy. So you, you make an appointment and you at one o'clock, you're going to go write a song. And they do this all the time in Nashville. But I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, unless you bring something with you. Right. You know, I, I think the, the idea has got to be a, a, a gift. Mm-hmm. It's got to be a, mm-hmm. got to come from the muse. You can't I, force it. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I don't think so. I mean. Was yeah. it hard raising a family as a rock and roller? Was what now? Was it difficult raising a family? It, it was difficult, but I had a great. Uh, my kids had a great mom, and that's very, very important. Obviously, right when you're on the road all the time, you know. Right. But yeah, it was. I mean, the one, the one, <laughs> the one kind of difficult thing is I'd come home, and I and I I'd want to go play with my kid, you know, or go we go fishing, you know. I say Austin, let's go fishing, you know. But what? But apparently, he'd been naughty or hadn't cleaned his room and his mother had grounded him <laughs> and, and, I, and I come home and I go let's go fishing and he, and she goes no he's grounded and he comes to me and she goes he goes dad what's the deal <laughs> who runs the show here anyway you know <laughs> and I gotta go well Austin you know I'm sorry because but I, I've been gone for five weeks and your mother is is I can't go against your mom here. I got to go stick with mom. I'm uh, sorry. You got to go clean your room. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and it, it killed me to do it, but, you know. <clears throat> what, um, tell us about, so, what happened in Dallas when you lost your hearing? Well, it, it was just a terrible, I don't know. It just, all of a sudden, gone. I, I remember I, 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 I had, took my nap. It was a corporate gig at Anatole Hotel where we played a bunch, you know, for, for a private company and, there was a guy called Pat Green, a country singer, a really good country mm-hmm. singer, who was going to open up for us. And I take my nap like I do, and I, and I get up from my nap, and my road manager answered, knocking on my door, and I open the door. I can barely hear the door, and he's talking. I can barely hear him. I said, something's wrong. He said, what? I don't know. I can barely hear you. Well, whatever. We'll go. Well, so I get, I'm get. i dressed. And we go down through the bowels of the hotel to get to the backstage entrance, and the other band is playing, and it sounded like warfare to me. It sounded like there was explosions going on. I said, "What's that?" They said, "Oh, that's the opening act." I said, "You got to be kidding me!" So I put my in ears in, and it was just a nightmare. It felt like 
it felt like the I was listening to speakers were blown, you know, just <laughs> bass part, which normally goes, it's the way it is now. Uh, if you play bass, that goes, bow, 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 bow. I hear. <laughs> oh. What's Distortion. It, what's it here like when you just made mention of these sounds? What do you hear? Do you hear the bass sound or you just yeah, hear yeah. what you said? Uh, no, I, I, can, I can hear. I can sing in tune to myself even. Right. You know, I can so you sing can, yeah. a little bit, but I can't hear any any instrument. Uh, even even one note. See, music is a hundred times harder to hear because than speech. Speech occurs primarily in a, in, a, in a small frequency range, in a reasonable frequency range. Music, even one note occurs in all harmonics and with harmonics and overtones occurs in all frequencies so it distorts to me it's just too much info i can't even even one note sounds out of tune to me and a chord a cluster sounds like noise oh my god it's horrible i don't it's bad enough not being able to play and sing i can't even enjoy music right i don't even listen to it and television you were saying zero Zero. I don't watch TV. I can't hear it. What was that transition like from when that initially sil- the silence hit you? It was horrible. What was that transition yeah. like for uh, you? Well, you you know you 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 understand. I mean, it, it was horrible. Uh, you know, here you go. This is what I love to do in life, and it's gone. I'm not, I can't sing. Can't make any money. What am I going to do? This blah blah. Well, and I, I just I kind of stayed in bed for three months trying all kinds of different you know all organic diet no salt uh acupuncture uh, chiropractic uh, uh, uh living ayurveda with different kind of indian east indian protocols and nothing did nothing helped you know and it was months of that and i, and I you know i was really depressed but my kids saved the day you know your kids right. thank god for your kid here right yeah, yeah and, sure. I mean, and he just came down and said, come on, we're going to go play golf. Come with me. We're getting out of, getting out get of, out of here. We're gonna... So the disease is men, men, meningers, men, Meninger disease? Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease. What exactly is that? They don't know. It's a uh, Meniere's disease. First of all, it's not a disease. It's a syndrome. That's uh, and it's, uh, uh, The way it was described to me is Dr. Stephen Rausch of uh, Mass General Eye and Ear in Harvard Medical School. It's probably the acknowledged godfather of the autolaryngologists uh, who know about Meniere's. He he had, when I talked to him, he had, he had six Meniere's patients that day and 300 that year, he says. And, um, uh, and he, it's he, the way he explains it, Meniere's disease is a debris box where if you have, here, if you have vertigo, uh, vertigo, uh, uh, episodes of vertigo that last longer than 20 minutes but not longer than two hours and you have tinnitus and you're a fullness in your ears it feels like you just got out of the swimming pool and they won't clear and a hearing loss and usually in one ear we call that meniere's they don't know what it is any uh, chance of uh of healing from that they don't know what i mean bill luxford at uh house ear institute i've been to I've been to House Ear Institute with seeing Bill Luxford and Bill Slattery. I've been to Stanford Ear Institute with uh, uh, Nick Blevins, um, Mayo Clinic with Colin Driscoll, uh, UCSF with Aaron Tward, uh, Stephen Rausch. Uh, these are the best, some of the best otolaryngologists. Della Santino and uh, Johns Hopkins. And, uh, and Bill Luxford looked me in the eye. He says, you know what the real diagnosis for what you have is? I said, no what? He says, we don't know. Hmm. They got no idea. Is this common in the rock and roll? You know, it's not that common, but it's not that rare either. Mm-hmm. It's not that rare. I have a little network of people that I talk to, and I'm 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 still trying stuff. I'm, there's now some evidence that this Canadian compounded drug called beta histine, referred to as CERC, a lot. It's the kind of the colloquial name for it. Um, it it's been prescribed for many years, but only at like at eight milligrams a day, and now there's. Uh, uh, there's an otolaryngologist in Munich t- called Stroop, Michael Stroop, who's been who's been um, prescribing enormous doses, 400 milligrams of beta histine every day, and 
Some people say it helps. And I, it's it's not an FDA approved drug. Mm-hmm. And I ask my guys, my autoerogologists hear about it and they say, well, he says, I don't prescribe it. He says, all the European guys do. And when I ask them, do you prescribe it? They go, yes. And I say, does it work? And they shrug their shoulders. <laughs> oh, man. Right. Um, did you see a therapist to get you through that transition? I did, uh, uh, but only uh, only a friend who's a therapist. Not a. I didn't go clinical necessarily. Right, right. When my my son got me going, you know, he, he got he got me going, and and then I then I then I I reached out to a few people at that point mm-hmm. to talk about how to connect. And 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 you know what it is really, it's about realizing that. Even though I can't hear, I'm still a very lucky guy. Right. I mean, I can fish. You have a great life still. Have a yeah. great life. And, and and zero to 60 for me, you're, you're zero to 60. We're 10 out of 10. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, but and, also, and, and there's a lot of people much worse off than I am. Yeah. So it's important to remember that. Right. But you also, too, professionally, you have a, uh, a play that I think is in we development. Do. We have a musical that we're hoping to get to Broadway spring. We're pretty sure we're going to get it to Broadway spring next next spring, spring of 2024. It's very exciting. We've been working on it for a, you know a decade. We were re- just about there, and then COVID hit. So now we've we've re- reworked a bunch of stuff. But it's 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 really been creative, mm-hmm. and it's been a salvation for me. Right, it's something to sort of get my teeth into. Right. Um, tell me about your fishing life now. It's it's quite prolific. Well, I'm I'm a you know I've always been a trout fisherman all my life so and i live in western montana and so i have a you know i have a drip boat and a and a nrs and we fish a lot you know <laughs> uh but i've recently not recently yeah recently maybe since i lost my hearing uh discovered uh saltwater fly fishing which is you know you told me years ago that i was gonna that i would never fish for tarpon and he, and you said, "Oh yeah, it's going to get you," and you were dead right. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm nuts for it. It's a life changer. Yeah, it's it's and they're just you know it's a, the creatures, it's the fish, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, they're amazing. Yeah, what's mm-hmm. your what's your favorite? Uh, and for me, it's it's different. I love it all. I love trout fishing, but there's a different vibe. When I'm in the mountains, it's more about just being there, f- hearing the river. Unfortunately, you don't hear it very well anymore. That's got to be aggravating. Yeah, it but is. you feel it. You feel it against your waders. Yeah, you I mean, know, I can hear boat. it a little with my hearing aids. Yeah, I, but not much. You yeah. know, I can't hear it. I can't. But I can hear it a little bit. Yeah. But is trout still your favorite fish? Uh, probably. Fish? You know, probably. I, I think trout and 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 trout, tarpon, and bonefish. Permit you can have. <laughs> <laughs> they're just, they're not even a game fish, I don't think. I mean, I've been so frustrated with permit. It yeah. just drives me crazy. I agree. And there's a, there's a bunch of musicians like Eric Clapton and uh, Roger Waters, Jimmy Buffett, that love to fly fish. Is yeah. there a commonality there? or you just I, think I've, never, I've never met either of those guys. But, you, but I think they're the only two guys, music, music guys, that fly fish. Is that right? I'm trying to think. Jimmy Kimmel. Is it is it really a avid? And the South Fork Lodge in 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 Idaho is he's he's remodeled it and it's unbelievable. It's really fun. So, but cool. the, but that's it. I'm trying to think. Henry Winkler fishes. Right. I don't. I mean, if you Google, I thought there was a I thought there was a guy in Iron Maiden that kind of scheduled his his touring around fishing, but I may yeah, have that wrong. That might have been uh, Ian, um, uh, the guy from right. uh, from. Um, you know what I'm talking about? What's her name? The flute the flute. flutist from Jethro Tull? Yeah. Ian Anderson? Maybe. I think he might be yeah. a fisherman. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Well, I think that uh, fishing can take you to a place that, you know, can calm you so well from a life that's been so so busy, you know. Um, tell me about your, your home in Montana. I think that, too, might be really great. Um, in yeah, the I su- mean, In the summer. I can't imagine living there in the winter. <laughs> Yeah, well, the winter's key because it keeps the numbers down. I mean, people say, why Montana? I always say, more cheese, less rats. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, you know, it's, it's, that's sort of flippant, but, but kind of true. Right. And, and it's the weather that keeps everything, that keeps the numbers down, you know? So 
I, I like it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I grew up in California when it was paradise and, you know, in the fifties and sixties and we fished and, you know, we went abalone diving and clam digging and, and steelhead fishing and duck hunting and then go over and ski at Squaw Valley for three hours away. And then, I mean, it was just a paradise, you know. Why'd you name your album Sports? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> well, Huey Lewis in the news, sport, but, and, 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 you know, I, I, because you are a big sportsman. Yeah. And, and I and, never realized how big of a sportsman you've and we been. We thought it would, it would be funny shoot it in the bar. That's our little local bar there, the 2 a.m. club. We call it the Deuce. <laughs> and uh, so it would be funny to sh show, be in a bar with the sports on television. Oh, Because okay. that's really how most people experience sports. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you've been a big golf fan. I've watched you play the uh, AT&T Pebble Beach event yeah. for a number yeah, of years. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I love, uh, it's great. Golf is a great game. I mean, it's frustrating now because I'm, it's- Swing my, speeds my golf, change and all yeah, that stuff, and my, yeah. yeah. my game is deteriorating. It's, right. What's your handicap? I'm a, a 11 point something. That's it's, good. Very, very good. But I'm thinking that you're, you're not really at this point now that you've You've moved on. Your your life is really secure with your fishing and your family and the variety of things that you love. I I would think that yeah, it's like hell yeah, bring it on. It's exactly right. Exactly right. I have a great life. I mean, you know, and I've always been a half full guy anyway. It's you know, it's always been half full for me. Yeah, oh, that's I awesome. miss music is all. I just miss. I I, I don't I don't miss being on the road. You know, right. 120 days. And I don't miss doing six shows in a row or five in a row. But every once in a while, it would be great to do one show. And I miss the guys, right? Yeah, I miss team. the camaraderie, you know, the, For sure. the, the, the the circus, as it were. Yeah. You know? um, is there anything else you'd like to add to this conversation? Sorry? Is there anything you'd like to add to this conversation? Am I? Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add oh, no. to this conversation? No, no, nothing. Just... I love your podcast. I love that that you that that you that you delve. Uh, uh, you get into the, the what is it about fishing that that speaks to your personality? What is it? Because I think it's commonality with all of us. I think we all it's 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 Mother Earth and Mother Nature. And I think if you if you go backwards. For any of us, or if you're a bird watcher or a mm -hmm. fisherman or a hiker or a ba bicyclist or whatever, when you go backwards, we all do it for the same reason. Right. And now you just moved into Boca Grande where we are now. Yeah. What's your next three weeks look like? Well, I'm going to fish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fish. I, I mean, I, I can't believe, you know, I, I know very little about Florida fishing because I'm, I'm new to this saltwater sport. But... I can't believe how amazing it is. The, the the several times I've been here, you just go out there. I know. And they're there. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing to is, me. Is this is your first time here in Boca Grande? First time I've ever been first here. Yeah. How, how, how were you influenced to get here? How did I get yeah. here? How, how, well, who influenced you to come A here? A bunch of my friends from Montana. A lot of Tom fish, Brokaw. fishing friends. Tom Brokaw's Tom, here. Tom Brokaw. McGuane. Tom McGuane. Uh, Danny McGinley, uh, Brown comes occasionally. He's got it uh, in the Keys. He's in the Keys. Um, you know, Austin Louder, you know Austin uh, probably. And so I just, it turns out I know a whole bunch of people down here. Lawrence Hall, his neighbor is a good pal. I, we fit Redfish, Redfish for. So. It's, no, that's awesome. Yeah, it feels great. It's going to be mean, a party. I've, I've been here one day, but it, <laughs> but it feels great. Oh, so yeah, really that's good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, uh, no, thank you. Is there any way? That you could sing something for us <laughs> right here, real Trailers quick. Trailers for sale or rent. Rooms to let 50 cents. No phone, no pool, no pets. I ain't got no cigarettes. I smoke old stogies I have found. Short, but not too big around. I'm a man of means by no means. King of the road. <laughs> That's so and awesome. the great Roger Miller the great great Roger Miller thank you so much that was, you that was so guys. wonderful thank, thank you, you so buddy thank you so you much when I saw it's West Side Story when I saw it's just a ride